begin at um, 7.15. School committee did vote to return to um, regular session at the end of our executive session, uh, which was on um, security, personnel, devices, or strategies. And uh, we did just take a photo with REF. Um, we will be in a moment uh, getting to that part of our agenda where we will accept that really generous gift. Um, I do want to say that um, Dr. Darty um, is not with us this evening. Um, this is only the second uh, school committee meeting in 10 years that he will have missed. And um, he is attending a um, event for his youngest daughter who's being honored at her university. Um, and so he's very proud of that. And although he was uh, very stressed about not being here, we told him we were confident we had this covered and he hopefully is enjoying that. Um, I would like to offer if there's any public comment for items that are not on the agenda. And I do not see any. Uh, so then our first item, which we we're gonna do before the consent agenda is to accept the donation from REF. So somebody's gonna sort of come up and speak to that and we'll get it on the record. You can We'd love that. Up here or over at the podium, Nancy. Either Thank way. you. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, through the generosity of our community, REF is pleased to say that we are um, funding $41,727 in grants directly to teachers for 2019. Um, every year, our fundraisers gr grow bigger and bigger. Festival of Trees this year um, is the largest that we've ever had. Um, it's becoming a wonderful town event. In addition to the trees, we now have full evening programs for families with young children and two full days of student and community groups performing. This past March, we had our second annual sold out musical bingo evening, which was a lot of fun and we're hoping that we can find venues to expand it and include even more people. This spring, um, we are not gonna be having a cocktail party that we've had for, I think like the last decade. Um, but we will be still having our online auction from May 6th to 17th um, through Bidding for Good. There's lots of good regional and local items on it, so please check out social media for links to um, participate in the online auction. In mid-May will be our last fundraiser for the year, which are teacher tributes, and you can honor a teacher by making a donation in their name, sending them a personal note, and they receive a small gift, and the proceeds are divided um, between REF and the local PTOs. So as far as this year's grants, um, we've, we are funding 12 grants, seven at the middle school and five at the elementary school, plus a professional development fund, which is a rolling admission, a rolling application fund so the teachers can um, apply for professional development as it comes available to them. Um, unfortunately, we received no high school grants this year, grant applications this year. Just to give you an uh, example of one at the middle school level and one at the elementary school level, at the middle school, um, both schools will be participating in a program called Building Compassion and Empathy Through Literature. B both schools will do an all-school read of the book Refugees by Alan Kratz, which is, involves three youngsters escaping Nazi Germany, Cuba, and Syria. And there will be associated projects in all the curriculum areas, um, including their advisory um, classes and it will culminate with an author visit. An example of one of the elementary school grants is um, a sensory motor trail that will be um, painted at all elementary schools including Rise Preschool. These um, spray painted outdoor um, trails allow for engaging and fun for youngsters that allow whole body movement breaks and help students self-regulate and regain focus for when they return to class. Um, and these are just, there are a few examples. Uh, you'll see the whole list in a press release and on our website at readingef.org. Any questions? Great, thank you very, very much. Thank really you. appreciate. <laughs> Hopefully we get some high school grants next year. Hopefully. Um, Great, I wanna Thank take um, just a moment. Uh, I uh, forgot, but it's certainly well aligned, a good time to do it right now. Um, 
We try to take a minute to remind ourselves about the mission of the public schools of our schools in Reading, and um, certainly REF is, a, is part of helping us to achieve that mission. So um, the short version is that we are instilling a joy of learning and inspiring the leaders and innovators of tomorrow. Um, the Reading Public School strives to ensure that all students will have common, challenging, meaningful learning experiences in the academics, health and wellness, the arts, community service, co-curricular and athletics. We will lead and manage our district and school community to reflect the values and cultures of the Reading community and guide and support our students to develop an appropriate to develop the appropriate skills, strategies, creativity, and knowledge necessary to be productive, informed, independent citizens in a global society. So as we proceed in our meeting, we try to remind ourselves and thank you once again to uh, REF for really helping us support that mission. I just... Thank you. I wanted to say quickly how thank you, but also how excited I was about the grants, the diversity of grants, but also those that are working with the schools to address the hate that we've seen in our, in our town and that there are specific grants that have been proposed by the teachers and accepted by REF that um, really address some of the issues of diversity and inclusion, welcoming and equity. So um, I just, I just wanted to remark on that because it's really a team effort to educate and empower everyone to be outspoken about this. Thank you. Great, thanks very, very much. Uh, we're gonna go on to our consent agenda and I need a uh, motion to approve that. Move to approve. Well, oh, sorry. You guys, we didn't accept the grant, and I, I don't have that motion. Move to accept, I need that motion first before we move, do consent. Uh, move to accept the donation in the amount of $41,727.38 from Reading Education Foundation as part of the grant program. Second. Seconded by Mr. Robinson. All those in favor? And that's a 6-0 vote. Thank you. Thank you. All right, now we'll move. Move to approve the consent agenda. I need a second. Second. Okay, and all those in favor? I actually, a friendly, I'm not sure how to add my. Um, we just actually took the vote. <laughs> Sorry. Um, what, what? Um, it relates to what I had um, asked before about um, Dr. Quorum on the minutes yep. of three twenty eight. Mrs. Engelson did update the minutes. So it's the same as what it was in the original. I believe it's not the same. Dr. Doherty reviewed it, and Mrs. Engelson actually updated it. So I looked at um, Mr. So Park's packet. It is updated from mm -hmm. that. Okay. My request had just been that Mr. Dr. Quorum's um, question that was asked and answered so well be summarized um, in the minutes. So I'm satisfied if that was done. What's in the minutes is it's not a transcript. The full transcript of the question is on RCTV. So it reads that at the conclusion of the meeting, Dr. Karm asked Assistant Superintendent Chris Kelly a question regarding the response that she gave regarding an email about mathematics that was sent to RMHS parent, Rebecca Lieberman. So that was updated from the original version. So okay, I had been asking for it to be a little more specific than that because it was. Right, I think this is a topic when we um, have our MASC rep and we get an opportunity to review our minutes policy, we're gonna have more dialogue because um, it's an issue, it's this uh, area of whether the minutes are a transcript and not a transcript. And the guidance from MASC is that they're not a transcript and our own policy actually is focused on the <coughs> votes we take. Um, and so we, we do need to address that. But right now, we're, we're um, until we change that, um, that's how I want. If you want to remove that, we have, I, we'd have to get a vote to remove the minutes. Okay, I just would like to remove those. I think we just voted to approve the consent we, agenda. We did prior to the... I actually don't know the Roberts rules on this, but we would have to... I don't know how you undo a vote. Okay, well, I will be satisfied putting it on um, the agenda of our minutes meeting, but 
um, it, right, that's um, hopefully for July. So, um, so the consent agenda, it, we did vote that. Um, I guess it was a 5-1, we should record it as a 5-1 vote then because then you didn't intend to support the consent agenda? Well, I w intended to support everything but that, or I intended to support that with the changes that I thought were in there. So, yeah, I guess so. Thank you. We will address the um, policy, yeah, in July. Um, okay, so reports. I know um, Assistant Superintendent Kelly has a bunch of reports. There were a lot of great things that went on in our schools. And Mrs. Dowd, do you have one question? Would you, and I will have. Uh, yeah, I'll have Mrs. Dowd do her report first. Okay. That's more exciting, I think. Oh, well, okay. it's very exciting. It's very exciting. So we just wanted to give the committee a quick update. At the last school committee meeting, we had given an update on grants, and we had listed um, a couple of grants that we had applied for, and we did want to let the committee know that we're very excited to say that the high school was awarded a very highly competitive grant from the state in the amount of $63,762. Wow. This grant will help promote the high school and the district's efforts to support the behavioral, social, and emotional well-being of students at RMHS. Specifically, this grant is going to be used to help launch the Stepping Stone Transition Program, which supports students returning to school from hospitalizations and will also be Excellent. used to provide some professional development opportunities and training for staff in youth mental health, first aid, trauma-informed classrooms, and mindfulness to enhance preventative practices and supports for all students at RMHS. One key part about this, this is actually an FY20 grant. So this will be effective um, based upon final appropriation from the state beginning in July. So we'll be using it next year. So we are excited for that. Excellent. Mr. Robinson? Is it, is it all in, in FY20 or is it spread yep, it's out? it's all in FY20. FY20. Oh. So we were very strategic with the grant not to include any staffing or personnel items. It's all one-time events for us. It's all the wraparound programming to really get this program up and running in a, in a high quality way. We're really excited about it. Um, and um, Courtney, um, our data coach, and Kate Boynton, mm -hmm. along with uh, Gail, worked on it. And um, we heard from many districts that had also applied that did not, did not did receive not. this. It's a very so highly competitive. We're really, really excited funding. about it. Uh, excellent. Yeah. And it was the full amount we had asked for, too, which was also nice yeah. because oftentimes they'll give you some, they'll give you some but yeah. it'll shave it down. So it was the full amount <coughs> that we requested. So that's kudos excellent. to the team. And yeah. uh, it's a win for Reading Sports. Great. So. I know. And that's an important um, piece yeah. we've been talking about the transition back to from, uh, from a hospitalization. So excellent. So then I just have a couple of updates. Uh, as mentioned at the last school committee meeting, we had our parent university, our second annual. Um, it was uh, fairly well attended, although I think we're looking at fall dates. Uh, when we had it in the fall, it was a little better attended. I think it was the first nice day we had had. So I think that definitely limited our attendance. However, we did receive feedback from our 17 workshops and our keynote, and everyone who came loved it. Mm -hmm. um, so we had our keynote speaker. It was a parent expert, Shauna Tomini. She was absolutely terrific. She talked about raising compassionate and caring children. Um, I thought she was really, really exciting. Um, also, thanks to the planning team who helped put it together, we had parents on that team that really helped uh, throughout the year. Our local experts who presented, uh, one of which is in the room right now, Julia Hendricks and Jason uh, presented um, and did a great job. We also had um, other members of our community, including Erica McNamara, among others. I don't want to forget anyone, but present. Uh, but we also had some other area experts. Um, huge shout out to the community ed department, including Sandy Colandrella, who really did uh, most of the hefty, heavy lifting with this. So we're really excited to look at year three, uh, which will be in the fall, more to come. We're gonna um, convene the team again and we'll open it up to other people who wanna join the planning team. We'd like to make it better and better every year. So we're excited about that. And then my other update is about Arts Fest, which happened this week. Um, that annual event uh, was Tuesday and Wednesday, 
and it, were, it was two wonderful nights of displays of arts uh, at the high school as well as two jam-packed concerts. The concerts included the sixth and eighth grade band and choruses, the high school stage band and chorus, as well as the jazz band from the middle school and the high school, um, and, and tons of art up and down the hallways. Just really, really great. So there was so much to be proud of um, as we celebrate the arts. I think it's such a great Reading tradition. And in addition, um, this was Miss Killian's last Arts Fest. Uh, I know we've said this over and over again, but 36 years um, in Reading School District is, is a lot uh, to be proud of. And, and she really has been a huge advocate for the arts. And I think um, I sent some very brief informal thank yous today to all the members of the Music and Art Department and really credited her leadership in that. Um, and we'll send more formal thank yous from John and I um, next week. Um, but <clears throat> one thing I wanted to mention, um, not a dry eye in the place. We, all of the songs were wonderful and the jazz band I think could uh, rival most um, wedding bands and concerts. I mean, really amazing. Um, there was a song with the, the combined choruses from middle school and high school, and I just wanted to say a little bit about it because uh, I don't know if Linda was there too. I, I, I cried through the whole song. It was really <laughs> touching. Again, I think uh, looking at what we're dealing with as a community and as a nation, they found a song that they sang and then signed as well, and uh, its name is We Are One. Um, and I'll just read you a little bit of the lyrics because I think this is so much of the work we do. Take a look around you, many faces, many names, each of us so different, yet our hearts beat the same. Join with me, take my hand, let your voice be heard, sing with joy resounding every note and every word. Each of us is special, unique in many ways, standing here together, sharing music every day. Imagine all we can do, imagine all we can be, if we shared the world with our love of harmony. We are one in music, we are one in song, we will not be divided, together we are strong. One by one, united in this family we belong, we are one in music, we are one in song. So uh, kudos to the music department, um, not a dry eye in the place, and uh, I believe in this message, so. That's excellent, thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, we have uh, some liaison reports, so just for our uh, new members, uh, Mr. Wise, Mr. Park, so, um, they, you do not currently have liaison roles. I may be talking to you about some sort of temporary roles that because we have some openings. Um, and then usually we sort of make a reassignment um, in the summer, sometime between June and September, we, we change that up. So uh, that, that will be happening. But right, the goal of the liaison roles is for a liaison of the school committee to either attend that meeting or um, perhaps you may not be always in attendance, you may watch a meeting if they're taped on RCTV. And the um, objective is to bring a report back to the committee so that if there's information that the committee needs to know in order to make the decisions that we make, that um, we can do that. So, and, and, it is, and as this is a public forum, the forum, that information then gets shared with the public. Um, so that's what the liaison roles are. So I'm gonna start with Mrs. Borowski. I know you, you have two, right? Two tonight. Um, my first is from the CPAC, the Special Education Parents Advisory Council. Um, they met on March 12th and April 9th. And uh, my apologies to them and to the committee. I did not attend in March because of a family commitment. I did not attend two days ago for no good reason. I was ready to go. I called the chair and I was a day late. It was on the wrong date on my calendar. Oh. Totally, I like, wish I had a better excuse, but I don't. Um, but as is my pattern in the past, if I'm unable to attend, I reach out to Ms. Stewart and the chair of the CPAC, and I'm lucky to have built some good relationships with some of the folks who are regular attendees. So I've spoken with two or three people who were in the room each of these meetings, so I feel like I have a good report for the committee. Great. Um, there was a large turnout at both. Um, on March 12th, they had a meet and greet with special education staff across the district. Most of the team chairs, a lot of the specialists were in the room. Parents had an opportunity to hear what our different <coughs> staff do. Um, understand special education in Reading and how it works. And then there was an opportunity at the end for parents to meet each other and have one-on-ones with staff. So it was very um, successful. Parents are very happy to have that opportunity mm -hmm. to meet staff and sort of meet with each other. So that went great. Um, and then two days ago on April 9th, the meeting I was sure was happening on April 10th, um, they had a large, again, a large, a large turnout of parents and our new director of student services went. Um, and 
chatted with parents, shared her experience. We were, I think, all at the open mic, so we had an opportunity to meet her. But it was an opportunity for parents to meet her, ask questions, understand her experience, her approach to transitioning into the role. Um, and my understanding from several people is there was a lot of positive energy in the room and a lot of excitement about her coming on board. So that is the CPAC update. I also have an update from the Reading 375 Committee. As you know, our town turns 375 this spring. And um, I would like to thank the town manager and town hall and also Dr. Doherty and particularly Ms. Engelson for their support in getting out the word on all of the events that are happening between May 31st and June 15th. Um, so the website is reading375.com. That's where you can see everything that's happening. Um, my request for my colleagues tonight is to the extent that you can spread the word, it would be most appreciative. Um, mm -hmm. appreciated. There's great events happening. There is literally something for everyone, baseball fans, musicians, artists, fireworks, food. There is something for everyone. So to the extent that you can reach out to your networks and spread the word, we would really appreciate it. Excellent. Thank you very much, Ms. Kowalski. And Mr. Parks doesn't have any yet. Uh, Dr. Doxer. Um, just a shout out, I also went to the senior recitals. Oh, yeah. The work that's done in that department is amazing um, in so many departments. Um, but I went to the round table with Mr. Robinson, and Mr. Robinson's going to report on that. Oh, and, great. and Mr. Wise. Yes, that's true. We had three members attend that. Um, okay, I have, well, let's do, I'll, I'll come around to me last, Mr. Robinson. So on Monday night, uh, Dr. Doxer, Dr. Doherty, Mr. Wise, and myself attended the uh, education roundtable sponsored by uh, Senator Jason Lewis and Representative Broder. Did I pronounce Broder. it? Broder. Yeah, Broder. 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 Uh, and it was basically to go over the uh, the Chapter 70, 70 formula and then uh, get feet and get kind of what the drive talk about what they view as the drivers are uh, in education funding, uh, specifically highlighted uh, special education costs and uh, health, health insurance costs. And then after that, there was a lot of discussion from uh, various school committee members and superintendents and select board members. It was a union. A, a union who didn't say anything, but they were there, and some t teachers who were very uh, vocal and articulate as well. Uh, just talking about the, uh, you know, the different things. There really weren't any solutions that came up as a result of it, but it was a good discussion for for uh, Ms. Uh, Senator Lewis and Rep. Broder to go back and and look to their committee uh, and work on this. Uh, the other thing that came up was all the unfunded mandates. I mean, we hear that a lot, and the teachers were pretty vocal on that, which is good. It's good to hear from them, you know, because uh, they're the you know boots on the ground. So. I don't, did I catch everything at the? Um, I guess the other thing I would add is that in addition to special education, um, there and, and health insurance, they mentioned that a uh, large part of the driver as well would be English as a second language, right? Mm -hmm. As well as low income, um, which I think we all pretty pretty much know and understand. And they they focused or tried to focus us on really only step one of the of the calculation, which is the basic calculation. Um, even when we tried to go into other steps, they brought us back to step one. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, they're not focusing on any local contribution or anything else along that right now, just on the first step. So there are step th three steps in the process overall. Calculate the foundation, calculate the local contribution, and then the state contribution gets put on top of those numbers. So um, Reading happens to be one of the 17.5% minimum numbers right. um, as it stands right now. So unless that changes, the local contribution portion changes, we'll, we'll see. Um, they also mentioned that there are three bills currently on the table out there. Um, there's Representative Tucker's bill, Governor Baker has a bill, and then there's the Promise Act um, that's out there. And the teachers in the room supported the Promise Act overall, um, but there was a lot of back and forth about the pros and cons and differences of those, mm -hmm. um, which I thought was interesting. So. Great. Thank you. There's, there's going to be um, a, an advocacy day at the State House on May 16th. 
So um, you can log on to the MTA Fund Our Future EMA dot org to learn more about that advocacy day. Um, and it was really powerful. There were also some students there and teachers that were also had spoken with their students, so brought their viewpoints to the table. And I was really excited to learn more about the MCIA, Mass Consortium of Individual Assessment. There was a lot of discussion about accountability and how there's some um, challenges to the um, stress that's put on the standardized testing right now and there's efforts to um, broaden and change that dynamic in education because there are a lot of other very important skills that are not tested on standardized tests. Um, so that was really exciting to hear about that effort. Great. And did, you're all set? No, okay. So uh, I just need to report on a, a couple of items. Um, I did attend the ATRAC meeting, uh, I think it was this week. And uh, the next meeting is the, the 21st. And um, one of the things that they're talking about is talking to the select board and um, trying to figure out June is um, Pride Month and what might be appropriate in terms of a symbol and a celebration and sending a message. Um, it aligns with uh, how do we become an inclusive community, what does it mean to be an inclusive community, and how do we demonstrate that. And so um, I think that was, uh, that was you know, the new item that sort of was uh, talked about at the meeting. Um, the other thing I just want to highlight, so to thank uh, Christine Kelly and all of the people who pulled off Parent University, I also did attend and appreciate it, attended Julia and Jason's session. Uh, I, I just want to highlight, because it sort of aligns with what Ms. Borowski said, about being in person, and I think um, it's really important that we try to take the opportunities to be in person. So like at the CPAC meeting where people had an opportunity to have a dialogue, um, the Parent University is such an awesome opportunity for our parent community to create a dialogue, be in person, and the keynote speaker was great. So uh, to the extent that we can encourage that, you can never mandate that, but if we can somehow figure out how to encourage that and um, really get people there and Instead of maybe you know other electronic methods, there's there's sort of nothing like that, and I think the song you highlighted sort of speaks to that, because in order for us to get to know each other, um, you know we, we have to be in person. So I think we're again I think the fall date worked better, so I think we're going to go back to that. Uh -huh. We did a ton of publicity. We had signs all over town. Yeah. Um, we did a ton of publicity. It was in the Chronicle. I, I think we did our best to get the message right. out. I think it's just the spring gets very busy. Yeah. That, that's what I think. Um, I, I, it's sorry. Old signs. Yeah. Uh, I just want to also highlight a couple Not things. Um, yeah, a couple things coming up is, um, that's true, the April 30th is the sort of newcomers at the library. And I believe we we're going to be there. We responded to that. Yes, we did. And, uh, so that was last, they started that last Most year. Sure and year. so we'll look for right a couple school committee members. Uh, I get, don't know the exact time. I have it on I have my an email phone. from Lisa Egan. I can forward it to you. Yeah. So we just need to make sure they can. It's 5.30. It's 5.30. Yeah. 530. Um, so there's a lot coming up in April because we have town meeting and there's four days for town meeting. And I don't want to say anything about how many days it's going to go. There's four days scheduled for town meeting. Uh, those are the 22nd, the 25th, the 29th, and the 2nd. And then the 30th is this at the library. And then June 15th is Friends and Family Day. And Dr. Doxer is going to help organize us for Friends and Family Day, which is generally on the field, Birch Meadow Field. Right. So, so there is a sign-up sheet here with different options of timing. So I figured if I... Um, I did it on a Google Doc, but I don't know the legality of us sharing a Google Doc for sign up. So good to sign I brought up. the hard copy <laughs> so yeah. people could sign up for whatever times they can do, and then I will look at what holes we have and figure that out. Okay. So it's a, if, if it's uh, administrative in nature, there's no, you're not breaking any laws. Yeah. 
I didn't think so, but I just so that right there on the side of yeah, yeah, that is the Saturday of Father's Day weekend. Just in case anybody is going away for Father's Day, it is the Saturday of Father's Day weekend. Um, okay, that's okay. You don't have to come to the first one. <laughs> uh, all right. So I think that's all the reports. I know we have a lot of our staff waiting, and I would like to get to that. So. We have an elementary school presentation and a middle school presentation, and I would like to thank our principals for Yay. being here. Um, and uh, we look forward to hearing that. So we'll go jump right in. So uh, we're going to start with the elementary team. Uh, the clicker's on the podium here, but the mic's over there. Um, just a huge shout out. We have uh, three of our elementary principals. The other two um, had previous commitments tonight, um, and uh, they helped work on the PowerPoint. Um, as they will mention, uh, the, we highlighted the things that are shared among the district. There are many, many, many other things that are going on in every school that are highlighted in their very, very uh, important weekly correspondence that they'll talk about. But I just want to say uh, what a pleasure it's been to work with them. They, they really are a very impressive team. We're very lucky here in Reading. Great. So without any further ado, well, thank on. you. Thank you for having us, and we're um, excited to be here tonight to share some of the highlights, things that we've been working on this year in the elementary school. So, Sarah and Julia are joining me. We're kind of chiming in, so it's not going to be set slides per people, but um, we have several things we want to talk about from communication, um, including parents, staff, and then with each other as a team. We're going to talk about the workshop model of instruction, we're going to talk about our science. So we're starting with parent communication. Um, that's obviously key to what we do, is keeping parents informed about what's happening in our schools. And we've worked really hard this year to be more consistent with the communication that we're providing to our families. So every school has a newsletter. These are shared on our website. Um, we typically send them out weekly. And um, each school includes information about specific highlights going on within their own building, but then also things that we're working on together within the district. Um, we also use the parent portal. That's a great way for us to communicate and get information to families. I'm sure if you're following us on Twitter, you've seen lots of pictures and postings. We really try and keep those current so that we can showcase some of our students and what's happening in the classrooms. Um, we also have Facebook. Um, and then, of course, we have very, thankfully, very supportive and active PTOs who play a key role in the success of each of our schools. Um, with teacher communication and staff communication, every week each one of us sends out a newsletter to our staff. Um, we also collaborate on those as well to make sure that we're being consistent, not only in our buildings with teachers and paras and custodians and everyone who works, to support our students, but also across the district in each of the elementary schools. So we have um, staff new newsletters that include information about meeting times and in-service dates, um, professional planning time that we have coming up, our assessment calendars, so we can kind of keep everybody in the loop with, right now we're working with the MCAS assessments. So uh, never ending, it seems like, months of MCAS assessments, but it's not really that long. But really just trying to keep people up to date with what's happening so that people are informed and can plan appropriately and make decisions. And to that, um, we make decisions together. So the five elementary schools work very closely together. Um, obviously, using the district school improvement plan, we build our own but then we all work very closely together to support each other around professional development to meet the needs of our staff, um, whether it's individual staff or things that we're doing across the district. We meet with the district leadership team on a regular basis, and then within our own buildings, we each have a leadership team that we work very closely with. So these are teachers and specialists and support staff who are part of the decision-making process within our schools. So. We collaborate, we spend a lot of time together, and then of course we work with the assistant superintendent and um, her team, the teaching and learning department, to plan professional development and workshops and training, look at curriculum and resources and materials to make sure that we're really trying to align what's happening in our schools with staff and with students. 
So as uh, Mrs. King spoke about, um, you know, we kind of have two big themes that we're thinking about this year, which is kind of how we work as a team across our elementary schools. Uh, but certainly how we work with our um, learning and curriculum department to think about what are all of our kids' needs and how do we align our practices across our buildings. Um, so although we each have unique personalities in our buildings and we have um, our sets of core values, we really want our instruction to look similar across the five elementary schools and make sure that they are aligned with what our mass frameworks are. So one of the ways that we do that is uh, we are really working to implement a workshop model across our elementary schools and they really align with not only what our district goals are for universal supports in social, emotional, and academic learning, specifically literary, math, uh, literacy and mathematics, but really think about what do our kids need each and every day, and this allows us to differentiate consistently. So a workshop model, just as um, for those of us who aren't familiar with it, really is an approach to teaching. It's not a curriculum, so it's how we think about our kids and then align our practices. Um, we create our lessons based on that and it's shared experiences across um, all of our curriculum areas. So by doing that, we can then differentiate better for our kids and we can also think about specifically within our classrooms, what are our kids' needs and how do we make sure we're, we're meeting those. So we um, do that in a variety of ways. Uh, we're going to highlight um, our literacy areas and our math areas that we're doing that this year. The other thing to think about is why do we do this and how do we do this? So we really want to create these shared experiences for our staff and our students. That's how we better align our knowledge base across the district and have shared expectations. So this highlights some of the ways that we're doing it, kind of in picture form. So we have um, in the top left corner our teachers getting together and really talking about their practices and what that looks like in the classrooms and then what it looks like um, in different um, workshops themselves with our kids so everything from what it looks like with our literacy development to our math stations and how again we you can see that there's small group learning um, and then a little bit of larger base learning but really it, it's about what the kids need and us addressing that in each of our um, expectations and core beliefs so we've been working um, Writers Workshop actually started in the district, I think going back 2012, we formed a partnership with Teachers College at Columbia University and we've been working with them since in really focusing on building a workshop model. So we spent a lot of time providing professional development for teachers K through five, using the units of study and mentor text around Writers Workshop. And this year we made the shift to Readers Workshop. So really implementing, it's a similar, um, format in that it uses the units of study, it's aligned for each grade level. Um, we're still working with people who have been at Teachers College and actually um, Elizabeth Moore, Christy Moraz, and Maggie Roberts who we've been working with for the past two years um, actually wrote the units of study. So they are certainly well versed in this curriculum and what it looks like to teach readers and writers um, from elementary all the way through middle school. So we've also been receiving coaching from them, working alongside our teachers, using lab site classrooms, so they're actually working in our schools with our real students in real time, um, working with them in reading to provide support to the teachers to learn um, and really to have an opportunity to practice this methodology for teaching. Um, we're monitoring their progress, obviously, through formative and summative assessments, which we do throughout, but, um, you know, it, for reading in particular, all of the schools are using the Fontes and Pinnell benchmark assessment. We do that three times a year. So we get a chance to look at the data. For our writing, we're using on-demand writing prompts in um, narrative information and opinion writing so we can look at our students' progress over time in the various genres of writing to see how they're doing. And then that information helps really kind of align the um, instructional practices in the classroom so teachers can meet the needs of the students who are in front of them in that moment. So just a quick snapshot about what Reader's Workshop actually looks like. Um, it's really giving students a chance to have significant more time with eyes on text and reading books that are um, of interest to them and meaningful for them. So the structure of the workshop is there's a five to ten minute mini lesson that the entire class takes part in and then um, the teacher may be working with small groups 
there's a specific teaching point um, in that lesson, but then students go off and they could be working with partners, the teacher could be coaching them, they could be conferring. Um, they're really focused on the skills that they need that they've identified with the teacher, and they're using um, that time to really kind of self-assess their skills, what they need to work on, and it's really a balanced literacy approach using lots of literacy pieces to the instruction, including um, read-alouds and guided reading, shared reading. It includes interactive reading and writing, um, and also word study to build their vocabulary. Similarly, the writer's workshop has a similar format. There's a, anywhere from a five to 15 minute whole class mini lesson, and then the students break off into, um, they could be doing independent work, they could be being pulled into a small skills group with the teacher, they're assessed using rubrics that are aligned with the units of study in each of the genres of writing. Anchor charts, which is that picture that's on the right, actually gives a visual prompt for our students. And these are hung up in classrooms. So if you're in classrooms where, um, if you've had an opportunity to see this, these are the visual prompts that kids can refer to throughout the process of writing. Um, really, our goal is to help guide them as writers and um, teach them that they're, they're writing for a particular audience and purpose, and we're celebrating their growth along the way. Good evening. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, elementary mathematics. We're really thinking about how to um, move to the workshop model for all of our mathematics instruction at the elementary level next year. There is not as a program like Reader's Workshop and Writer's Workshop for Math. So where we're starting is really looking at what we teach. And what we teach is the Massachusetts curriculum frameworks for mathematics. Those are our curriculum. The Reading curriculum documents, which were published this year by the Office for Learning and Teaching and are on this website, come directly from those documents. We teach those through programs. Right now, we use Math and Focus um, at all grades. We um, use a series called Developing Number Concepts in kindergarten, first and second, and some in third, and then use a series called Developing Number Understandings in grades three to five right now. We also have to bring in other materials and lessons because what we know is that there's no one program that teaches everything that's in the state frameworks which we are responsible for teaching. So we're always going to be in a position right now of having to look at those frameworks and find out where we need to augment or where we need to bring in new materials. The math workshop model works very similarly to reader's workshop and writer's workshop. And as a matter of fact, when I have taught some workshops on the workshop in math, and we actually use that same structure that's in reader's workshop, just moving into math. So you have a whole group mini lesson that's very focused on the goals for that lesson, on the content goals. Students then work independently or with the teacher in small groups. And they can be working on things as different as what's in that unit right at that moment, then also anchor tasks for important concepts that go throughout the entire year that children may need more work or extension work on, and then also um, children who might need intervention could be working on that at the same time. So in that workshop, you have children working on mathematics but in different ways on mathematics all of which is connected back to those state frameworks. And then the class always comes back together for a wrap up at the end that refocuses on the goal or the key questions the teacher was asking the children to think about while they worked. Because what research kind of shows us is that you remember the beginning of something really well and the end of something really well. And sometimes the part in the middle can get a little lost. So we really need to anchor our workshop with these two coming together experiences for the students. This year, we've provided professional development for all teachers grades three to five, including special educators, on this Developing Number Understanding series. And this is a series which has a lot of uh, tasks and activities that can work very well in a workshop model. Um, it also does a really nice job of connecting the whole number system so that children, it teaches whole numbers 
and gives experience with decimals so that children see these as being a connected thing and don't have this moment where they go to decimals and think, wait, this is a whole new number system. So it's a very connected, integrated approach. Uh, we had professional development for that in the fall and then another round of teachers did professional development in the spring. There were also math in service at the professional development days on Wednesdays. There was a math workshop course that was taught two Wednesdays. And then in one course on one Wednesday, it was very specifically about mini lessons and how you keep them mini and still get the important information out. Grades kindergarten to second grade have continued to focus on developing number concepts, which has a really important foundational, num foundational number learning for children, and using the Assessing Math Concepts series that we started about, I think this is the second year of full implementation. We had a half year, and then this is our second year of full, so for about two and a half years. And one of the things about this series that's really nice is it gives very definite links to instructions, so when you assess a child, when you get your results, it says this is the thing these, this child needs to do in order to get stronger in this area. Science. This has been a big year for science in K2, and Heather um, uh, Leonard has worked from the Office of Teaching and Learning, has worked really hard to create um, a science series for our kindergartners, first graders, and second graders. They have hands-on activities that are based on the science learning standards from 2016, and they're very much sequenced so that they build on each other year to year, and the children are getting a really hands-on experience that's supporting them as they are then going into third grade, which is where we begin the No Adam program. So this has been piloted this year. All of our children have done it, and um, Heather Leonard's done a lot of work with teachers around implementing this, giving them support in terms of resources. She's had drop-in office hours at the different schools so teachers can come and get support as new, in new units are introduced. And there's some pictures of our students doing science. And that is it. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to just, uh, if people want to take any questions okay. for the elementary teachers, we will do that now. Um, I know I do have one, so I can start off. Um, I actually wrote it down. Okay. On your um, elementary mathematics, the slide, how to be a math person, do math and be a person. I like <laughs> that. It's simple. You can do any kind of math and you can be a person. It's um, achievable for everybody. Exactly. So um, the, you have a couple of different um, sort of programs there. You talked about the grade levels that some of those target and then sort of other lessons. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yep. So what I was wondering was like what assessments do you find are most useful in sort of diagnosing where you might need to adjust and like add a program, adjust a program, or add material like what so which of the assessments that you do are most useful to you well the assessing math concepts which really cover foundational number concepts and we use them in kindergarten through second grade even though we all they go through two digit addition and subtraction we also use them with maybe some older children who have some missing blocks in their math knowledge um, those are really powerful and they're powerful because they can be their interviews, they um, are, some of them are fairly quick, some take a little longer, and they really dig down and what is it that this child does not understand mm -hmm. that is keeping them from being able to work with larger numbers, from being able to understand numbers as groups or understand place value or learn their number facts. And one of the things that's also really helpful about that is because it's linked to the developing number concepts mm -hmm. series that you can then, okay, so these children are struggling with learning combinations to 10. These are specific teacher-led tasks or independent tasks that they can do that will support that. So that is very successful. We're really working in grades three to five about there's no, there isn't something like that published right now for older grades. So one of the things I actually was doing a math workshop with and we were talking about is doing math interviews. So how teachers can create quick interviews that they can give to children that have easy 
ways to record that then can quickly be sorted out so you can say, okay, this is kind of where my children are in my class right now. Say, understanding I recently, some third grade teachers are working on one for multiplication and how do you find kids who can know the distributive property, the commutative property, and are using sound multiplicative strategies and multiplication, but making it quick. Um, and an interview works really well because you can ask the child, how did you do that? As opposed to if you get a written response sometimes, mm -hmm. they have an answer incorrect, but you don't actually know why it's incorrect. Um, so there we're still working. A lot of the teachers are taking the math and focus end of chapter assessments and modifying them so they either more closely align with what we're trying to teach on our frameworks or that they will have a question where they might use that to ask the child some questions about how did you solve this so they can get more information. Um, so we really, the assessments where we can find out the why they're making the error instead of just the fact that they're making an error are the ones that are gonna have the most impact on teaching. And I think just to add to that, the nice piece about the developing number concepts in K-2 is that it really takes away some of the written component that you see in something like a math and focus end of unit assessment. So when the kids are younger, it's a lot more, as Julia said, the explanation as to what they're doing. It allows them to use materials to show their thinking, to talk through their thinking, um, to go back and forth and manipulate things. So as the teacher's sitting there with them, they're seeing not only what might be the computational errors, but what are the conceptual errors that they're making? Do they not have an understanding that of one-to-one um, -one correspondence or that a number represents a visual also? Mm -hmm. um, and it also takes away that pressure of a student who um, may you know, struggle to be writing some of their answers down. It allows them to kind of show it in a different way. So it's much more approachable um, and allows teachers to really ask that question. So you're saying at the end of the day, gee, is it that they didn't understand this question that we might see on a written component, or is it that they needed to show their work in another way and they're still understanding that concept? So it's just much more flexible. Thank you. Um, Dr. Roxy. Thank you for mm -hmm. this presentation. Um, I'm really excited that it sounds like these interviews um, are like scaffolding too, where they, it's a learning opportunity for the students and the teachers as they're going through this problem. Can you sort of paint a picture for me of how this works in a classroom of 23, 25 people? Like if, if you're doing this with, is it doing this with one student or is it integrated with the class or sure. how does the time work and what are the other kids doing during the interviews? That's magic, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I, mean, I know you well, guys very, are magical. The teachers are very skilled. There's no question about that, right? Um, they're well-oiled machines. So part of that is the routines in the classroom. So again, because of the workshop model, the kids are already used to doing small group or independent work there. And so they're used to the teachers not um, being the only one speaking through that whole hour or half hour, whatever that period may be, right? So the interviews are one-on-one. -on -one and they are with the teacher sitting there with that one student um, doing that. And for the most part, um, you know, at the beginning it might be a little bit different, but uh, they're, they take anywhere between five and some of the longer ones are 15 minutes per child. Um, but you can integrate it into the workshop model. So the teachers have already done the mini lesson, set the tone, the kids know what they're going to work on, which is set for what they need. So they're already engaged in what that is and then the teacher can pull away and have those individual conversations with the kids and, and still have the rest of the class buzzing. And yeah. it may take two weeks mm -hmm. to do mm -hmm. the assessment for one class because you, I mean, obviously you're teaching and you still have 20 to 25 students that you're managing um, and that still need some attention and instruction. So it does take time to do it. It's important that we do it, so we do it set periods throughout the year and then we use that information to help realign some of the activities instruction that's happening in the class. Thank you. Ms. Sprowski. Um, I, I just want to commend the work that you're doing. I had the opportunity um, three or four years ago, Ms. King, you invited me to Wood End and I saw a writer's workshop model in a fourth grade classroom and it was my first experience seeing it and it really is, it's not an exaggeration to say magic because you, it's for folks who aren't familiar, the kids are so used to the routine that after the short mini lesson they just go off in pairs and they work independently for 30 45 minutes and i walked around and the level of discussion the level of work and the level of writing they were producing was impressed i was blown away by how powerful it was so last year i believe the readers workshop was implemented at eaton last year 
I think they started it yeah, a little bit ahead. It's been in a few, in a few schools. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So last year, Missy Polito mm -hmm. invited me to Eaton, so I got to go see the Reader's Workshop, and as a former high school English teacher, seeing, I had the exact same reaction. This is exactly how we should be teaching literacy. So I could not be more a fan of this model for a whole variety of reasons. Um, and I'm over the moon to hear you're approaching mathematics this way. I think it's fantastic. I'm very excited about it. Thank you. Mr. Weiss? Sure. Um, thank you, ladies, very much. Um, I don't want to cause a kerfuffle with this necessarily, but I have a question based on past history. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't think any of you, well, Mrs. King, you might have been at the time, but back in 2013 14, we had a bit of an issue where math and focus was a problem from an implementation perspective, and we didn't get through the books. Mm -hmm. And that caused a problem for some parents, mm -hmm. right? From a communication perspective, they didn't understand. There were worksheets that were doing off, offline and whatnot. Um, and with the, the focus on communication that the whole district is trying to do, mm -hmm. how are you managing the communication from school to home with regards to what's being done in math and focus versus these other two possibilities and how they're helping each other, mm -hmm. right? So at the end of the year, if a child comes home with seven chapters done, that's because that was on purpose, mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. because they didn't finish something. Yep. Can you talk a little bit through that a little bit? Mm -hmm. I think some of that, and Julia, feel free to chime in as well. The, the shift that, one of the things that we didn't do well was when we first implemented Math and Focus, we were learning it. So it was a very new curriculum, it was a very different way of teaching. And I think people kept talking about, you have to teach it to fidelity, you have to teach it to fidelity, what does that mean? Cover to cover. And we literally taught, tried to teach. Some of those standards weren't even in those grade levels. They should not have been taught. So it took us time to really learn the curriculum and really learn the essential standards and what needed to be taught in each grade level and to be more aligned with our practice. What that resulted in was we identified the gaps. So what's missing now in this particular grade level, for example, grade three, if we're teaching a unit in math and focus and we realize, wow, there really isn't a lot here, but they're expected to know this and they're not demonstrating mastery of these skills yet, where else can we pull? So that's when we started looking at additional resources. And I think part of putting some of those curriculum documents together was really to help parents understand what these essential standards are and that our curriculum is the standards. It's not math and focus. That's a resource that we use to teach, mm -hmm. similar to Engage New York, similar to the units of study for writing, but that's not our curriculum. The standards are our curriculum. Right. Does that make sense? It, do it totally does. I'm just trying to kind of cut off at the at the pass yeah. a bit of a potential challenge if something were to go right. yeah. sideways well, I think a little bit. The fact that we didn't have published materials as well mm -hmm. uh, led to that gap as well. Yeah. So that's part of why we wanted to get ahead with, especially with the literacy, um, the writing, the reading, and the math standards for yep. K to five right out of the gate yep. because we knew that our program is does not equal curriculum. Curriculum yep. does not equal a program. We are really culling together things. So those documents that exist on the website are, are really tools for parents and they've been very well publicized mm -hmm. and actually very well read. I feel yeah. like when I talk to parents around the community, they're like, I've looked at these. Yeah. They, they really look great. We are then working as a district to build some more infrastructure for our own selves. So we are looking at best practice and having sort of um, mm -hmm. teacher resources, yep. in-house resources where we're saying, oh, this is a really good assessment for this. Oh, this is a really good document for that and that's a lot of the work that the learning and teaching department has been doing this year mm -hmm. with coordination with the principals um, and just as another caveat they they talked a lot about this workshop model but I just want to say you know a huge shout out we have been meeting regularly throughout the year on Wednesdays and having teachers differentiate their own expertise and level in these and really self-reflecting on what do I need a little more practice with and um, the principals and um, the members of the learning and teaching team have done a nice job with that. And I think teachers are starting to feel like, yeah, this is what we're doing. But as far as parents getting that information, we'll continue to publicize that. We'll continue to, to get that word out because we want parents to know that yes, we have a very cohesive plan, we know what we're doing, but it, you're right. It's not gonna be like the old style workbook with every page filled, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that we didn't do it. Oh, it I just means that we did it some other way. Yeah, I totally understand exactly yeah. what you're saying. I yeah. just, I can envision some parents, well, the even having read through that, yeah. say, well, yeah. how does that title The with old this style of teaching really was that. You started on yeah. page one and you got through Warner's English, right? right. Every single, right. Um, that's not how we teach anymore. And, and frankly, our standards don't allow us to teach that anyway, anymore. None of these programs are aligned perfectly with the mass frameworks. And they're not allowed to what works 
here in Reading. So we use our standards, our frameworks as our goal and, and as our target. And then we, we look at like what does Reading do? Because we know that we actually don't set the bar just at the state frameworks. Mm -hmm. we, we want more. So um, we, we start with that and that's where those essential questions and that's really how those guides were written. They actually on the back of the page two, it has all the essential questions of what we're looking for and it even has a resources column that says we may look at these things. Mm -hmm. So it, it may be time to republish those again and, and just let folks know this is where they live, this is why they're here. But um, we've done a lot of work around that. And, and also to your point, um, some of what we're doing is messy. It is yeah. messy. Yeah. We're learning to what Mrs. Broski was just saying. We've started the units of study and we've done writer's workshop for quite a while. Reader's workshop, we implemented it. Joshua Eaton started. And then there were pockets of teachers throughout the district who had been doing writer's workshop for a while and quickly embraced reader's workshop and wanted to start it earlier. So we're in different stages of development, but we're all going to get there. Next year, we're all doing it. But everybody... I mean, the teachers have been amazing with really, you know, opening it up and learning it and trying something new. And they know it's going to be messy and they're not going to be perfect. And we're encouraging people, colleagues, to go in and observe each other and see what it looks like in other classrooms and ask questions, especially some of the teachers who've been doing it a little bit longer and share some of those experiences. It's going to be a little bit messy. The kids love it and they're reading and they're making gains. And that's the most important piece. Okay. Thank you. And just another caveat too, I know we mentioned this at an earlier school committee meeting, but um, we did purchase the newest edition of the Fountas and Pinnell uh, benchmarks. Right. Everyone was trained in the district. Some were retrained in the district. Um, and we built an assessment calendar that's being followed uh, district-wide. So um, that's a huge gain. And, and as, as, um, as Dr. King mentioned, you know, these assessment systems are actually built with the workshop model in mind. So they know it takes two weeks to get through things or sometimes longer. So, you know, we're, we're, we're really using our assessment calendar with math and with reading and, and teachers are well aware of those dates. Um, and we're continuing to look at that and tweak it. And as Joanne said, it's messy. Um, we're definitely asking for a lot of feedback along the way from our staff and listening to what they think is best practice because they're the ones doing it. So, thank you. Thank That's you. That's excellent. Boy, Pretty you guys, time. the middle school teachers now, tough <laughs> act to follow, yeah. huh? Well, don't you worry. We are ready. Yeah. So thank excellent. you for uh, the elementary team. And now next up we have our middle school principals, and they're going to lead you through some um, latest and greatest things um, that are going on in the middle school. Um, the elementary uh, team definitely focused on some new things that were being done across the district in elementary. I think the middle school is just refocusing uh, our plan, some new things, but some things that we're really proud of that, that really focus on middle school developmental levels. So thank you. Thank you for having us. Um, we realized we didn't put our names on our slides. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll take a moment. I'm Sarah Marchant. I'm the Coolidge principal. I'm Ricky Shanklin. I'm the, the Parker principal. All right, so we should have put that on that slide. But we thought we'd <laughs> we'll ourselves. pretend it's there. Um, and we always love coming to share what we're doing with you all and welcome to the new members. We're excited to get to know you over the next few years. Um, so the work that we're going to present tonight is some work that really excites us because it's what we live and breathe every day. Um, we really set our goals last spring for the year ahead based on what we as administrators really felt like our level, our middle level teachers and students needed. Um, but we also took some time to dipstick what our teachers were feeling and what they felt like they needed and where they felt like they needed development. And we were really pleased that they, their vision was aligned with what we were seeing too, which really helps because it puts everybody on the same page and there's more buy-in to the work that we wanted to do and because we now are doing it with our teachers rather than kind of presenting things that isn't natural to them. Um, and we also took some student data last spring to figure out how they were feeling because a big part of what we're always thinking about is the social emotional well-being of our students because we know when they're feeling safe they're then feeling more ready to learn and that those two things go hand in hand and you can never forget the social emotional piece at any level but especially in middle school where the development of the students are, is ever changing by the day and we really want to <laughs> carry them through that time of their lives very carefully. Um, so our, we had two common areas of focus this year the first one is around the social emotional learning and we have kind of three subcategories of that that we will dive into on later slides but 
our advisory program, which we have talked about before with you all, and look forward to updating you on that. Lynn Lyons, who works on anxiety in kids and adults. Challenge Day, which we've also talked about, and we'll look forward to updating you. And our second main area of focus are inclusive practices, or practices that allow entry points for all kids in the classroom in terms of whatever subject it is. Um, and through those, we have worked with Marion Small on math, Adam Hickey from Landmark on kind of executive functioning type practices, and we've also worked with our teachers on their own sharing and practices with each other. Um, and these focus areas for us <coughs> are mirrored in our district improvement plan, as well as not only our school improvement plans, but each of our own personal administrative goals. So uh, the connection of everything feels very organic to us and very natural, and we're really excited about it. Um, so I think we're going to start off with advisory. Yep, so I'm going to talk a little bit about advisory, um, just to give you a little bit of the history, because we did talk about this last year, but we were in a much different place last year. So um, at Coolidge, they did have advisory before, um, before we had it at Parker. So we are actually in our second year of what we call our new advisory. Um, so as Sarah had already mentioned, we dipsticked. We did surveys with our teachers and the students last year, which allowed us to get a lot of good information, create a team that worked over the summer, um, for several days over the summer between Coolidge and Parker. And we actually were feeding off of what the elementary teachers had already worked on, um, led by Lauren Sabella, um, our um, behavior, social emotional learning specialist in the district. So, um, so we, just so you have a common understanding of what happens with advisory is we have about 15 to 20 minutes at Parker, it's, every other day and at Coolidge it's three days a week so um, similar amount of time as we go throughout the year and our goals for advisory are the same across um, grade levels so our goals are actually the same but as you'll see we'll get into that we have different themes now these goals were were derived from our committee in the summer looking at what the feedback was on the surveys looking at the social emotional learning goals that the elementary had already um, already developed for K to five. So we worked off of what the fourth and fifth grade goals were and kind of developed those um, in the areas of self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision making. So you'll see those words in that language woven into our grade level themes. So. These are our goals of advisory. So, of course, fostering safe spaces to nurture discussions, giving the kids opportunities that, um, for safe, thoughtful reflection, perspective taking, um, working on their problem solving skills, developing self awareness and identity, um, learning who they are themselves within their small advisory, within their um, team, their grade level, the school, and in society. So there's a lot of parts to that. Um, promoting inclusion and acceptance and connecting socially. And it, at, uh, you know, it's, it is a small amount of time, but making those social connections in small group with your peers and, and um, one adult. Um, so um, I want to just kind of mention and, and thank the teachers that were involved in this process over the summer. They really, um, they helped Sarah and I present this to the teachers at the beginning of the year. And they were so invested in working through and finding resources um, to help with our grade level themes. And they were digging deep. We ended up um, using resources from Teaching Tolerance, Facing History, Common Sense Media, and of course, um, the ADL with our World of Difference activities. Um, so we wanna thank the, these teachers for spending so much time over the summer and really helping us work through that. So our advisory themes, so just taking a look, you can see that some of our themes, they might sound different, but they're based on on their grade level and they really build on each other. So for example, in sixth grade where we have um, anti-bias in seventh grade that is accepting and understanding differences and those are approached differently at each grade level and using different resources. So 
the wonderful thing about what we did previously last year was we worked through all sorts of activities through Facing History. So we had a lot of, a lot of material to work with in um, supporting a lot of our themes here. But we found that, that um, the pre-planned lessons that, that were actual, like full lessons, were really, really too meaty. And it made it seem like uh, more of a classroom experience than a, than a real... Um, um, authentic, authentic and genuine um, experience for the kids. And that was something that was loud and clear with, with the kids and the teachers in, in the surveys that we did last year. So, so we, in the beginning of the year, the teachers start off with building their, um, building their space, contracting their space. They did a lot of team building activities in their small groups. Um, and then they work through these themes. But for the first about month of the school year, they really are contracting their space and making sure that everyone feels a part of the group and welcome and able to share. Um, and in certain, certain spaces, that takes longer than others. So there is a flexibility among you know, the groups to work through these themes at their own pace. But they really are given the opportunity to um, kind of make it their own with the activities that we provide for them. And they can look elsewhere. And we do encourage and give them opportunities throughout the school year to share those resources. And we have um, Google folders that they, for each theme that they can go in and look for their activities that they want to use that best suit their group. And they can also add things that they've done that they've been successful with and share it with other teachers. So some things um, that I, I kind of already mentioned a little bit that um, areas that the, we've been successful in based on our most recent surveys, um, is that our flexibility has allowed for the teachers to actually choose activities that match their group, that really set the tone for their group, and that their students are buying into and interested in. And also the flexibility allowed for integrating topics as needed as they come up in our building. So there are times when we have sensitive topics that need to be discussed, things that are happening in our building that the kids really want to talk about that um, that's the opportunity to do that. That's a safe space for them to ask questions and, and get deeper understanding of things that are going on. Myself, um, Sarah, school, the school psychologists, they may be invited into advisory spaces to talk about certain things. Um, so that, that happens quite often. Um, and, and sometimes the students, the students will ask for that. They'll say, can we have you know, Mrs. Shanklin come in and, and follow up us, with us on a few things? So it, it is really a neat time for them to kind of give their suggestions about what they need during that time. We also had, between both of our schools, we were able to report out that depending on the grade level, over 80% of our kids um, feel like they are connected to at least one adult at school. That is better than what our, um, what our data was for last year. They really, they had a, they had a harder time with with the more structured um, formal, units. formal yeah. units that were that were given to them, and an interesting thing that happened over the summer, we did all of this really awesome work, and um, Facing History had had ended up revising their advisory program. They were working with us last year and kind of making it with us and for us, and we were working closely with them. And then this year, we had done all of this work, and about two weeks later, after we had done all of this work. Um, I had been in touch with them, and they had revised their whole, um, in their whole middle school program into activities versus the dense units. We had been giving them a lot of feedback all throughout the year about the, about the program. So then I was able to take a lot of those activities, some of them we already had, and then put them into the spaces that um, the themes where they were appropriate because they had some extra new materials for us there, which was very exciting. So we definitely have, have, an, have, have had an evolution, as Ricky has said, from Facing History, which is a wonderful resource. And I do want to say we, now, we have an ongoing relationship with them. Now that we had the original grant pay for that year of consult, um, they will give us any resources. We can take books out. We can continue to use them to um, vet what we need. So that's a really great ongoing resource. Um, so I just want to make sure you know that's on, that is continuing through the work we're doing. Um, so next steps as we look to next year, we're continuing to solicit feedback from our teachers and our students. Um, but just as our students are very different learners, all of them, our teachers are very different advisory teachers. Um, some of them 
said this was, you, you know, all these resources were phenomenal, but it was too much for me to go through, and I just want you to give me something. And other teachers said, I just love having that opportunity to pick and choose. So we're really almost having to now create pathways for different teachers, where one way was a little bit too structured one year, and this way might have been a little too loose for some. We now need to create that tight, loose balance, and so we, need, we have a little more work to do in that way. Um, you know, and some teachers just say, we just want more time just to talk with the kids so without you telling me what to talk about because there's so much value in just seeing what the kids bring up and, and or, organic. Mm -hmm. So, um, and we'll all, we're also reflecting on the grade level themes. I think there's a lot of ones that are very, very rich, but we al almost need to slow down a little bit and really say mm -hmm. where are the kids at and simplify sometimes what we're doing with them so that we're taking the time to listen to where they're at in that moment and what they're stressed about or what they're thinking about. Um, and not necessarily fulfilling our agenda, but fulfilling theirs. So kind of reflecting on what that might look like for next year. Um, and one piece of data that we're thinking a lot about is 50%. We just did a survey in March. And on an increasing level from six to eight, students feel more and more stressed or anxious about schoolwork and expectations. So we know we need to kind of slow down and really help them around managing their time perhaps and figuring out what, it, what about it is stressing them out and how can we break that down for them and help build up their capacity around, around that. So that's just an example of data we will use to create a new theme probably for all grade levels. And like I mentioned before, just time to talk and whatever, about whatever the kids really need to talk about. And they are thoughtful about it. It's yeah. not just like chatting with your friends, it yeah. actually, there is, a, you know, each, each advisory teacher has their own sort of structure for posing a question or today I'm thinking about, yeah. or like sentence starters and things like that. So that do allow the kids to, to bring out what they're, what they're really thinking about. So um, regarding the social emotional learning, we did have Lynn Lyons come in and present. She spent a couple of hours with our staff um, on a Wednesday afternoon and then she also came the next day and spent an hour presenting to each of our um, student bodies. So the purpose of that is so that we're all speaking the same language. So some of you might remember her from um, coming and speaking at a parent presentation here in Reading at the PAC um, a couple of years ago. She was amazing and the first thing I thought was we have to have her come and talk to the kids, the kids and the teachers. They all, they all need to hear this. Um, and it was loud and clear through our surveys last year that kids and teachers were all, this is an area where they all wanted support and, and um, advice. So, like I said, the purpose is so that we have a common, the purpose of this was to have a common language, not only across, you know, across Parker, but also across the district um, at the middle schools. And basically the gist of what she, um, what she, talked about with the students and the teachers were to change, you want to, work, you want to work on changing your reaction to anxiety. So retraining your amygdala is basically what, what she was saying. Um, and she said you could do this by learning to expect, externalize, and experiment. So the three E's. So, so expect. So start thinking about when does your worry show up and what does it say? What's the consistent theme? So kind of getting to know it. And then externalizing, so creating distance between you and your worry, and then kind of taking a look, and look at it and see what is it. So I'll actually hear, and I'm, I'll actually hear like in my building, when I, if, you know, student, or teachers in class sometimes, and I've heard, a, I've heard a couple of students say it too, I'm gonna put my worry over there. Like I'm gonna put my, like it's there, and I'm worried about something, but I'm gonna put it over there. So give yourself some distance so you can take a look at it and kind of understand it better. And then experiment, so take action, take responsible risks, um, shift your focus, do the opposite so that you're on offense instead of defense. But if you can take small steps to retrain, retrain your brain to react differently, but it takes repetition. It takes practice and it takes repetition. Um, so if something's making you uncomfortable, you're going to be a little uncomfortable, but taking a small step and a small risk toward it will help start to train your amygdala, and the more and more you do that, um, you're still going to have worries, but you're actually going to be able to respond to it and, and in a more positive way. Um, some of our other takeaways, she said, don't let your worry be your life coach, because it can take over. Um, take reasonable risks, 
don't believe if someone tells you you're not changeable, you can retrain your amygdala, and you want to do, you want to do, you don't want to avoid. Um, so it was, it was great, and, I, and we are hearing, um, hearing the language used mm -hmm. in our buildings. Um, we'd be remiss not to mention Challenge Day while well, we've done this four and five years um, in a row now. It is a very important part of our social emotional experience um, for our eighth graders, and especially for those new to the board, just to get you up to speed on what we do. It's a two-day experience at each school where students participate on one of those two days, as well as parents, teachers, and members of the community participate, and we invite the school committee every year, so it's, we'd love to have you. Um, the overall goal of the day-long experience, and it is run by this outside organization called Challenge Day, is to in increase empathy among each other, and they do that through a series of activities that are very well structured and aligned, and these are true professionals in the mental health fields who are running this. Um, and a couple of their major themes is they, they relate all, all of us to an iceberg where you only see a little tiny bit of the iceberg on the top, over the water, and there's so much more to icebergs obviously underneath the water, and that's just like humans or any of us, and we see each other for what we see on the surface, and we show each other only what we want to show each other, but all people are a lot more complicated than what we see and what we show. And they encourage students was, and adults and anyone in there to lower their waterline a bit and share their stories about who they are more, more on the inside or less visible to others. Um, and that sharing is a very, very powerful experience because that's how you build empathy is when you learn each other's stories. Um, and they also talk a lot about bias and oppression and how what implicit and explicit biases are and how you can't help the biases you have necessarily because they, they are what you know and what you're raised with and you don't even know you might be biased in some situations. So it's good to kind of challenge that thinking for our students and to then empower them to, and a phrase that they use a lot is be the change, to stand up for bias, to stand up against bias, to stand up for oppressed groups, to stand up when you see things that aren't right um, and to really embrace each other for differences that we all have. And as was said earlier, despite the, in that song, despite our beating hearts that are all the same, to also celebrate all that is different. Um, and then we tie those themes into some of those eighth grade advisory activities that we do afterwards um, and try to keep those themes going throughout the year and our buildings do that differently. But it's an important part of our ongoing yearly message. Um, and I think, let's see, benefits just in general, I, I don't think we have a slide for this, but really explicit teaching about these things and not just figuring kids are gonna figure this stuff out, but really um, pushing their knowledge on these topics. Um, that idea of connecting to each other and to adults is huge for all of our students, but this is one of those times where in reality you can see it happening. Build empathy, and by doing so we do see fewer unkind behaviors, less bullying, things like that. Um, and when issues do arise with kids, because kids aren't perfect and they make mistakes in middle school, and we now have a common language and a common experience to draw from when we talk about the mistakes that they're making. Um, to allow students an opportunity to connect with adults and know they can ask for help if they ever need it. And sometimes some kids are flagged through this experience who were able to help right away. And the, and the impact of that is huge, knowing that you might have helped one kid really shift their life who really needed a lot of help. Um, and normalizing those ongoing discussions about mental health, how we treat each other, and um, just great, great themes that really we feel like they're ready for in eighth grade. Um, and I know we're getting, we're taking a while here, so we'll try to speed move on up. to the next thing. But we're excited. And there's yeah. a picture from this year, and it's very enthusiastic too. Um, so as a part of our inclusive practices, we've been working with Marion Small this year with. Um, all of the middle school math teachers. So she worked with us for two full days, one day in November and then one day um, last week. And the first day that we worked with her, she was focused on modeling and experimenting with open-ended questions and parallel tasks. Um, that she really, really wants us to get the message across, wants the teachers to have the message that we want our students to be thinkers, not just doers. Our students are compliant. 
they are. So, but we don't want compliant students. We want students who are who are thinkers and thinking about the concepts and coming up with ideas and bigger ideas. And she does this. She modeled this and had our teachers practice it through questioning strategies. So um, it gives our students from at varied levels the ability to um, find entry points regardless of what level they're at um, and through asking open-ended questions and giving them parallel tasks they can they can meet the those concepts at where they're at she also gave um, give the teachers opportunities to like she would she would ask open-ended questions and give them parallel tasks and then they could use whatever materials she had out and play with them and she didn't necessarily say you're going to use these materials to try to figure this out so there were things that were available to you if you needed it and you didn't have to if you didn't want to but her bigger focus was that the learning comes from the sharing and the discussion and it's the way that you ask your questions that you can learn what the students already know with their prior knowledge. Um, and we, wanna, we want to get to the skills through unfolding concepts and the questions that you're asking and the questions that, um, and the, the ideas that are coming from the students. So it is, it is very intentional. Um, it takes a lot of skill. So the teachers were, had an opportunity to have it modeled by her and then practice those skills. Um, she, on the second day, she focused on teaching concepts versus skills. So she would give us, she'd put up um, a standard um, from the frameworks. And she, she did this at all grade levels. And the teachers had to practice. She would ask, what are the bigger concepts? And when you take a standard and you step back and you look at it, they're very meaty. They're not a checklist of skills. And that's intentional, so that we're not just checking off that we're teaching skills. It's a way of the teachers actually have to look at it and pull out the concepts, the larger, the bigger ideas, and, and formulate their activities and their questions based on what those, what those bigger concepts are. Um, and it is, it's all in the power of how you ask your questions and giving students the opportunity to meet it at their level and then bring that to the discussion so other kids can learn from each other. And she gave lots of examples of where higher level students in the same class are learning from, from, the, from lower level students and, and where they're coming from and they, you know, and saying, I didn't think about it that way. That's another way that I can think about it because they're, they're at de different de developmental levels. Um, um, I think that's, yep. that pretty much covers that. And we have worked with Adam Hickey from Landmark this year, and we've met with him three times. Um, two, and two, let's see, two, oh, three professional days, one that was just yesterday. Um, and his work with us has been two, um, two afternoons and then one like workshop model with our teachers. And what he's, he's talked about a lot, I mean, he ha he's phenomenal if you've ever had the chance to work with him or hear him. He's given us so many tools. So I can give you a little glimpse, but it's, there's so much more <laughs> behind this. Um, but really his overall focus is on metacognition. And that is really about how the brain learns information, how the brain stores information, and how we use this brain-based research to create effective learning environments for our kids. But also helping them to learn about how their brains work and metacognition so that they are actually taking time to use um, internal language, let's say, and writing and reading and visual strategies and taking pause and really honing in on what they're focusing on. Um, so it's, there's a lot to that kind of training of their brains and there's a, what he calls maybe some low hanging fruit and then there's a lot more that's deeper. So we've started with our teachers with what we call the low hanging fruit and a lot of those have to do with executive functioning tasks that um, the common idea is that if you align practices and you align structures, that there's more predictability for kids. They're, so their brains have to work on less about what to expect when they go into different learning environments. And if they know what to expect and they know it's the same as all their other learning environments, then they know they can just really focus on the curriculum rather than all those extra pieces. Um, so the low hanging fruit that we've been working on with our teachers are the four bullets here, like posting of agendas. And that might seem silly, 
but I will use a model from here. Like when I came into the school committee meeting today, I looked to see what the agenda was and it really helped me to know, okay, where's my presentation relative to all these other things? And it just helped me to understand the, what the night was gonna look like and where my part was gonna fall in it. And so I didn't sit here worrying, like are they gonna call on me right away or mm -hmm. um, what's about to happen? And now I could just frame, frame the night for myself and that just really is an example of how that helps kids going from one classroom to another. Um, queuing the midpoint, I'll skip purpose. That's just letting them know when we're halfway through a task or an activity. And reverbalizing directions, that again has to do with metacognition and taking things not just from being noise in the background to when you internalize something, it becomes more reality. And when you're able to say it, you understand it better. Same with writing something. Um, We've shifted from those low hanging fruits to now focusing on the purpose of what we're doing, just as we creating our presentation tonight, making sure we're trying to talk about the purpose of why we're choosing these things we're doing and why we were doing the things we are with kids, but why in every lesson or activity is that important and why does it have purpose and what is that purpose for that child so they really understand and can connect with it rather than it just being a check, something to check off. Um, so I'll, I know I moved through that quickly, but there's a lot going on and we could do a whole other presentation on that. I think we're taking a lot of time. And we have a former relationship with Adam Hickey. He has worked closely with some of with the bridge program, um, the learning based program at Parker and he's been in our classrooms and he's worked with teachers and he was someone that when we were talking about inclusive practices and wanting someone to come work with our staffs, he was the first person who came to my mind because he's, the teachers are receptive to him, he's, he's just got a great way about him, teachers take feedback really well from him and, um, and so it's, it was, he was a welcome, welcome um, instructor in our and building. The high school is now working with him as well on the same thing. So right. we have alignment, um, really cool alignment now going on from middle mm -hmm. to high on a lot of these same practices. So, and that will be ongoing work too. Mm -hmm. um, and our last thing we'll touch on is just the fact that we're using our own strong teaching staff within our building to, Im to really share practices and to visit each other's classrooms and to celebrate each other and learn from each other. And these look different in our buildings. This is my teacher's first year of formally getting into each other's classrooms. Um, and we're doing what's called praise walks and the high school is as well. And that's just, they've been assigned, they can choose any classroom they want the first time around. And then the second time I assigned everybody a random classroom. They go in for any sort of observation time, 10 minutes or over, and then they leave positive feedback. And that, and on the left is an example of feedback that one of my teachers gave to another just based on what she, witnessed in that classroom and it's really just to boost that positive experience that you get when you get see something new or you experience so someone else's space which wow. we get the joy of doing all the time and we wanted our teachers to do the same mm -hmm. um, so I've been really excited by that and the teachers have been as well and so this is my our second year at Parker doing instructional rounds um, and it's kind of a practice that I brought with me from from the last school that I was in and um, this year, we were able to take our instructional rounds and put our focus on the, in the inclusive practices. And am I observing these across the different classrooms that I'm going into? Um, so they have a cohort of five or six teachers that they're, um, that they're all observing classes. And at the end of the day, they come together and they share their experiences in the classrooms. This year, I had them actually following a student. Each of them followed a student because I also wanted them um, I wanted it to be twofold. I wanted them to live a day in the life of a Parker student. And so um, the reactions to that have been very interesting. You know, the teachers are now making the connection between the importance of consistent practices across classrooms. So, and something that Adam Hickey had, had really talked about with the staff um, all three times that he's been with them is that if they're consistent practices across classrooms, the students activate much quicker. So they come right in, they know what to expect, and they're, um, you know, they're more likely to get activated in the lesson right away. Um, they see the agenda, they know, you know, they, they know what to expect. Um, so that's, that's, it's been a really great experience. We also, um, I know, I, I did a survey afterwards and took um, suggestions for if we continue to do this and follow, you know, next year, how would we change it? Because it looks very different from how we did it last year. So. And we just want to make note that a lot of this work was due thanks in part to the School Climate Transformation Grant um, in which we were in the last year, which really helped pay for substitutes, which allowed for a lot of the PD work, um, Marion Small's visit, as well as books 
and advisory book. So we've been lucky to benefit from that grant. And I think that's it. <laughs> Sorry, we won't take a long time. Thank you. Very it's going to be too. <laughs> so great. I will. Um, Lots of questions. Yeah. We'll take some questions. I have just a, one quick comment, and I want to. Um, so, Shara, uh, Shauna Tomini, who did the opening at the um, mm -hmm. Parent University. You know, one of the things she, she talked about social emotional learning, and she talked, and her book I thought was um, it, um, it was about how to how to create um, sorry creating compassionate kids, essential conversations to have with young people. I thought her perspective was was really balanced. I might be a little bit more old school, you know, sort of pick up your bootstraps and keep moving, kids. But um, anyway, the that's how I treat my my children was sort of a little bit more that perspective. So sometimes I, 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 I come a little slower to some of the things that our students need and, and children need. And I thought her way of presenting it was excellent, but one of the things she really highlighted was that lots of times people think, or parents may think, you know, you need to do this and teach your young kids. And they stop, um, you know, okay, they're fifth graders now, they're all sad, you know. Right. Mm -hmm. And she highlighted how important it was not to. She also highlighted that this district, unlike many other districts, is so committed to it and that we are threading it through. And I, I think I didn't, I haven't truly appreciated that um, and the power of that. Um, I recently found out a friend of mine from work who's just bought a house in Reading and I'm, you know, looking at this presentation, I'm like, I'm gonna give this to him tomorrow because I'm so excited to say, you, you are so fortunate. Like, look at these great schools you're going to come into. So, um, but I just really wanted to highlight that, that that connection between the social, emotional, and how it's so critical because it enables kids to be, you know, we always said, to re ready to learn, and then these strategies to help them activate right away um, and, and have that toolkit to, um, I want that one, put that worry over there and you know, sort of get focused over here and know that I'll give myself time to experiment with what I can do with right. that a little later. <laughs> so I sort of love that concept, so thank you. Um, Mr. Parks? Outside of advisory, is there anything else for follow-ups either school's doing with something like a challenge day where kids are, are brought in and, and are allowed to open up as a group again? We have different, yeah, and this is where we start to do things a little mm -hmm. bit differently. I can give you a Coolidge example, but I'm, um, we, our kids are, are reading a book right now in an eighth grade class that we have under our wellness umbrella. Um, we're, we're reading Dear Evan Hansen, actually, and we Dear, have a conversation. Dear, Dear, Dear Evan, Evan Hansen. Hansen. I mean, yeah, right? Dear Dear, yeah. yeah. And um, like the play, yep, yeah, we have the book. Um, and. The kids go on a rotation, with, and this is with our school counselors, so there's a lot of themes that re kind of parallel what they talk about in Challenge Day that then recur in the book, and that's purposeful. And so it gives an opportunity to continue those discussions, but in a way that's not necessarily as internal for the kids, but it is, can be about something a little bit more external, and it's a little bit safer for some kids. So that's an example. Mm -hmm. Very good. And we do so something similar. So it's built into our advisory um, time where, um, our seventh and eighth grade read um, short stories, like very short stories, and they're more um, more focused on um, individuals, individuals' experience to kind of spark. Some of them are a little bit edgy, so that it that um, and more about anti bias, more about um, understanding differences, and the kids will talk about the choices that other kids have made because it is outside themselves, and they can have that conversation. Um, but that's more the way that we. Um, that we do that. We do follow up with Challenge Day as far as um, some of the activities. Challenge Day gives us quite a few activities um, that we can follow up with throughout the year. So we do use those and implement those in our advisory space. So. Ms. Sprowski? I was really happy to get an update on advisory. Um, I really appreciate the thoughtful approach you're taking to it, and I'm actually really happy to hear that it's changed significantly. Mm -hmm. I'm aware, not in Reading, but of some other schools where advisory isn't done well, mm -hmm. 
and it really can be very detrimental to a culture and very unhelpful. But what you've shared and the approach that you're taking, getting everyone on the same page, working with some consistency, but then having the flexibility for teachers and students to work within that mm -hmm. and create their own space, it seems like a really smart approach. So I really appreciate the enormous amount of work you're putting into it, and I'm optimistic. We'll continue to do so. So <laughs> to follow up with that, so I something that um, I found really neat within the last day, um, an, an English teacher shared with me one of their students' project that was to um, counter an argument. And so she did a video on school safety and countered the argument that the answer to school safety is like um, bigger bolts on the doors and all, that that she, she thought that the, um, the counter to that is advisory. That advisory is what will make the difference. Connections with people, relationships is what's going to make the difference. Not making our schools safer by putting bars on the windows and and things like that. So I was really touched by that. Yeah. Dr. Doxer, um, so many things that. Thank you for what you're doing. Um, I remember a time when our middle schools were on opposite side of the town and they didn't talk and they didn't <laughs> have, it time, was <laughs> still opposite. Yeah. not coordinating. And so I'm so impressed and appreciative of the work that you do together, sharing and um, listening. This is my other point, listening to both the teachers and the students. So what I heard from you was, that you requested and got feedback, honest feedback on your advisory the first times you offered it and that it's been an evolving process and that that reflects both the needs you're discovering from the kids and the needs that the teachers have. And empowering them, I think, is really important. It, it's role modeling for both of them, mm -hmm. that change can happen and that their feedback matters. Um, and I think that that's, thank you. Um, and so I had one question. I know that um, Challenge Day is not funded through taxes or, or our budget, and I was just wondering what the status of it. I've experienced it many, many times from its pilot four or five years ago. Yeah, five years ago, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I think I missed one year. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I find it very powerful and moving and what you said about relationships was reiterated by the conference, Mass Association of School Committees Conference. The theme was relationships, relationships, relationships. So I was just wondering if that funding is in place I can yet. A, I can answer that. So we're working on the funding for it. We agree that it's really important, uh, and we know it's not in the budget. So we're looking at all, any and all options so that we can keep it, it going, and that is our plan and our hope. So more to come. Thank you. One minor thing, oh. uh, Mr. Wise. Real, really quick, um, and this actually might be for you, Chris, as well. Instead, sure. Um, you guys, you raised a point about that fifty percent or so of the seventh or eighth mm -hmm. graders were feeling anx anxious about expectations and homework. Work. Yep. That echoes what we heard from some of the students yep. in the high school. Yep. And many of those kids are going to the high school mm -hmm. next year. Is there a way, thinking of vertical alignment, we can invite one or two from each of those schools into the homework committee? in some way, shape, or form to participate or provide feedback into that, especially since they're gonna be there next year anyway? So um, we're just about done with our initial meetings with the homework. We did have a student representative on that team, um, and our, our goal is to publish some of the recommendations um, that we, we think will really help with uh, looking at stress. But I agree that we should, what we should really be doing is inviting the middle school team to look at that and say, what are the age appropriate sort of trickle down? If we're saying, mm -hmm. you know, uh, look at your time budget and, and having like absolute stop times on different things and things like that, we need to start looking at that. I mean, the middle school isn't as heavy with as many activities as the high school, but you know, for instance, we have both have middle school plays and we love that and we love sports, that part, yeah. Yeah. but Very we have busy, to look at yeah. what is what is reasonable to expect mm -hmm. a, a 12 or 13 year old to spend and then have to go home and do homework. Yep. So we want to be fair to the, the product and, and we know we have such tremendous art, science, sports, all of these things, but all of them take a bite out of the apple yep. and you yep. only get so many bites. So mm -hmm. that's something that we've been working on really hard at the high school. It's definitely a conversation that it sounds like we're going to have we're to having, start. Yeah, we're having a lot of conversations <laughs> yeah. about authentic assessment yeah. mm -hmm. and the work we do with kids and, and really 
how you're assessing knowledge and why. And so we're looking at assessments in general and we're looking at homework as a part of that. And I feel like we're only in the beginning of that whole assessment piece. And it's mm -hmm. an exciting next step that we'll go, but I think that ties in with that discussion. It's an important part. Yeah, I would just, yeah. one more comment and then sure. we can close it down, I would say. Um, just because they're not in high school doesn't mean they're not busy with other things. Yeah, they're really oh, right. I mean, okay. oh, they have so all, all the other things in there. Interests, right. And, and it, I would say also from a continuity perspective, some of the uh, more experienced teachers or the regular teachers are well aware of the other activities going on. But I know for absolute proof for my own daughter that mm -hmm. some of the substitutes are not and are assigning large projects on Arts Fest nights, for example, yeah. which was uh, extra stress yeah. when they're already going here from 3.30 till 8 o'clock that night. Right, you want them because to focus the on that one stuff. thing yeah. and enjoy that so, one thing, yeah. Just little anecdotes. We have to continue to work on that. I mean, I yeah. think yeah. the principals yeah. do a great job. I read all of their newsletters, oh, and let me tell you, they include everything but the kitchen sink in them, but again, one has to read it, process it, and, and deliver it. But that's good information for us to have that we need to work on that. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you, middle school team. Thank We're uh, very lucky to have, um, I echo Linda's comments about having them work together. Um, I've worked in many districts with different middle school models. Um, I've never seen such a collaborative team um, like, like the way Parker and Coolidge really is working together now. So that's, that's a tribute to the leadership we have. And that's true with the elementary team as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I work more closely with them uh, day to day, week to week with the elementary team. But it's really amazing to see such, um, I think I, I put smart, caring, confident, you know, I could go on the list, um, women who are, are leading our schools right now. We're, we're very, very, very lucky. Thank you very much. I think um, that concludes our agenda for this evening. I just want to, if uh, committee members can take a look at Linda's sign-up sheet as we leave, that would be great. And uh, Thank you. April 30th is 5.30 to 7.30. So anybody who's interested and available on the April 30th, just talk to me. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Um, need a motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn. Second. 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 Seconded by Mr. Robinson. All those in favor? Excellent. Dinner before 10. Uh -huh.